All right, I, I think it's 3.05, so I think we'll get started. <clears throat> so, buenas tardes. Uh, thank you guys for coming. That's for you, Brad. Uh, so, thank you all for coming. Today, we're going to do something a little bit different. We wanted to do a sort of spend a little bit. We had some time this afternoon, and we wanted to, you, you know, we wanted to figure we wanted to figure out something different, something a way to show you guys uh, sort of a high-level concept, show you a, a practical sort of a practical example. And the problem we had was that when, when you do, you either do a, spend the whole time doing a demo or you spend the whole time talking and either way you don't get, you sort of don't get both, both things. You don't get a, if you try to do a demo, you don't do both things uh, properly. So since we had the whole afternoon, what we decided instead to do was to talk about microservices. And and beyond that, we actually have a really interesting example, and we have a good demo. And sort of in, in the first in the first presentation, this the, the part one, I'm going to be talking about microservices and how sort of how a new way to look at them, a more more complete way of looking at them. And then in the next session, we're going to start thinking about what it means to build a microservices application. We're going to we're going to then start looking at sort of the backing services, the services that, that aren't doing the actual work of your application. These will be the services, sort of like your databases, uh, your file store, stuff like that. Uh, in part three, we'll look at your actual workers. We'll look at the, the sort of the, the microservices that are, deployed on, that are deployed on OpenStack or Cloud Foundry or, or containers. And then finally, we'll bring it all of that together with DevOps. And we'll show how, you know, using DevOps, how a developer can can build something on their laptop, can commit, and then sort of related to the, the the discussion this morning at the keynote with Infra, how there's this automated workflow, and the the whole idea is to basically show how, you know, much more than OpenStack and and Cloud Foundry and Docker, there's all these uh, open technologies, open cloud technologies that come together. To, to sort of make this easy, okay? And you know what, I was thinking now, why, why would we talk about microservices? Well, it turns out that, that a lot of the people presenting today, including myself, uh, are working on, uh, on this Apple Swift. It's not the, the OpenStack Swift. We're actually working on this Apple Swift uh, website internally for IBM for, for the server, what we call the server-side Swift. And it's something called the, the Swift Package Catalog. And so this is a, a website that, that we manage right now and that we've built, we are building, and we manage, and we operate. And this website is sort of an instantiation of a lot of the things that we're going to talk about today. It is based on microservices. It's architected for that. It has really uh, interesting, uh, it has a really complete workflow, a DevOps workflow. We actually based it on what infra, what the infra project is doing, uh, and then, and sort of the the interesting thing here is that so we're we've been working a lot with with the Swift programming language, and what we're going to do today is the demo, and we'll talk a little bit more about it in, in, near the end of this. But the demo itself is going to be a, a demo that you all can download and can follow along if you want. It's it, it's something called the IBM Blue Pick, okay. And it is a demo that, and it's the, the code's available on GitHub. We just updated, they just made a release this week. And it, it's basically a Swift, um, and I'll tell you a little bit more about it, but it is a server-side Swift application that has an open OpenWhisk uh, serverless component, connects to databases, connects to, uh, to Swift, the uh, OpenStack Swift object storage, and it, it basically does a very, some, some interesting processing, connects to Watson, does some interesting processing. So we'll, so anyway, so this is where we're coming from. We understand, we understand open technologies, we, we work in the open technologies team, and we understand microservices. And so today I think we'll, we'll I want to get started with sort of this, this problem that we're seeing when we talk about microservices. The issue that we see is that people really think about 
uh, microservices in, in, in a couple of ways. They really focus on the, either the technology or the tools that, you know, the, the, or how, you know, the technology, the tools, but also how do you like decompose an application, the architecture? And we sort of feel that, that that's an incomplete way of thinking. And what that means is that we've, we've come a long way, right? I joined IBM in 2000, and since 2000, since, I mean, I can tell you firsthand, since we joined, we've sort of been progressing along this way of development. When we started building, when, when I joined IBM, the, the, the way to build applications was really a, a basically a document-driven development process. You would have the offering management team create a document, a physical, like a Word document, a Lotus document in our case, and you would create this document, and then it would have all the requirements. It would be then handed off and given to the architects. The, the, the architects would then sort of develop high-level view of the application. They would give that to the, to the devs. The devs would then create a plan. Their plan would be like specific, you know, even a calendar plan. That would be then given to the testers who would take the features and, and write out a test plan. That would then be given to your support team and then the, the documentation people to create uh, installation guides, operation guides. And the problem was that everyone was separate. You had huge silos, and beyond the silos, there really was this huge area of friction between them. I mean, I remember times when we would open up, we would create a, a feature, and then test would open up a bug against it, and we, we'd, you know, the development would fight with, with test, that's not, a feature, that's not a bug, that's the way it's supposed to be, test would fight back, there would be this back and forth, and until it got escalated, would the issue be either, either closed or it would be resolved. And so there, was, there ended up being a lot of, you know, a lot of uh, inefficiencies. It was taking us, you know, 12 to 24 months to get through this whole process. We would see, as developers, you, when, when project management and architects were defining something, we were doing nothing. Uh, as soon as we were done with development, we would give it to test, and for a couple of weeks, we would wait for, for a result. And so for the longest time, and that happened for everyone, for the testers, for, for architects, for, for offering management, you, were, you would do a lot of work, late nights, they would buy us pizza, and the rest of the time you just wait. And so, and actually that, that's the rest of the time was when you would take your vacations, do all that. And so, the, this was something common, not just in IBM, but in the industry, and so you started seeing this move towards Agile, right? And Agile had this idea that the, the release of a 20, the 24 months it took to release a project, a product was, was crazy. Uh, we should focus on smaller work increments instead of having these massive projects. Uh, let's start trying, Agile wanted us to start focusing on, on more frequent iterations. And the idea was that you would quickly get prototypes out so that people could use them. And so, as we started moving into Agile, into Agile teams, we started seeing, uh, we started seeing that, you know, the, the, the business requirements gathering, the architecture and the development sort of became closely tied, right? There was less friction there. Uh, the idea was that by using, uh, once we were in Agile, we started, we started seeing some improvements there, but there were still issues, right? We were, uh, testing was a big problem. With testing, we still had, there was a dedicated phase for test, actually multiple dedicated test, uh, phases for test. But what we started seeing and what we started realizing was that you could actually, we were, we were automating all our code, all our testing. There was already virtualization was available. We were creating automated test, te test cases. And basically you started seeing this move towards, uh, people started thinking, well, if the automated test case pretty much covers, does exactly what, what our, our test phase is doing right now, why don't we just build it into development? Why don't we just include testing into development so that if every time I put a commit, we, we just get an automated test? And that was a situation where we had this combination, right? We were now, we were now continuously integrating our code, all right? Well, then there was a sort of a, a mental change in, in people's minds, in management's mind, and 
we were saying development and tests were saying, look, the code that we have is, is stable. We know it works. We know it, we could get it out there without any consequence. Why don't we, instead of, instead of having to, to do a separate test, we know it'll pass everything. Why don't we put it into production? And, you know, a couple brave companies decided to do that. And these were all probably, you know, startups who didn't have the, the baggage of, or the, the the, the memory inside of, the, of their companies to know otherwise. And they started pushing into production directly from commits. And again, this is something that you see in OpenStack. And so what, what ended up happening is you had this, this move from continuous integration where the testing was automatic to continuous delivery. And so you had the gap between uh, business development, QA, and now operations was all, the, all these squads were now be, becoming sort of uh, a unified squad, the teams were getting big, were getting more focused on a task, and these silos were, were disappearing. And so what we saw at this point was that the, because these were now, we were moving more towards the cloud delivery, cloud applications, we started seeing a situation where the developers were operators now. And, you know, operators are very different then the, the role of an operator is very different or was very different than the role of a developer. Uh, an operator had to worry about, you know, run books, had to worry about uh, getting called, having beepers, getting called at the middle of the night, uh, worrying about uh, disk failures and server failures, communication failures. And what we saw now was that because the developers were used to, you know, they were different, used to working different hours, used to doing, uh, automating a lot of processes, you started seeing that the development teams started actually working to optimize the, the flow of, of, of operations. So they, they, a lot of the manual processes became, started to get automated. A lot of the run books were, were scripted. Um, a lot, of the, a lot of the processes, the day-to-day -day processes were, were sort of optimized. But another big change was that this really was the first time that developers saw what it meant to run their application, right? What did it mean to, how downtime affected them, how it affected their customer because now they were the customer. And what you started seeing is this move, this change of architectures. You started seeing sort of a, uh, because the developer didn't want to be bothered at 3 a.m. on Friday, they started building in uh, resiliency, uh, failure, failover. They, they knew, they expected things to crash, but it doesn't mean that, they, they expected a service to crash, but it doesn't mean the whole environment can, would, would go down. So now, they would get a notification, like right now, we'll get a notification on Saturday, that a service went down, but it doesn't really affect anything because orchestration brings up another one and, and the environment c continues to be available. So anyway, so what, at the end of this sort of move from continuous delivery to DevOps, you had this idea of, of, of greater resiliency and of, of, of a higher automation of your day-to-day -day tasks. And so, as I sort of hinted before, the last big move was that you made these technological, you, you made these changes based on the uh, virtualization, the changes in your organization, and the changes in your methodology. Really, the, the final big change that we, we've been seeing in the last couple of years is this move from the monolithic applications to your microservice application. Uh, if you're obviously, if you're building a new application, you're, you're starting with a cloud native application, this isn't the case, this is something, you don't have all this baggage to move, uh, to sort of migrate from. And so what, there was a couple, a, a lot of actually benefits from microservices. There's some downsides, but the biggest benefits are, you know, it used to be when you had a, I mean, I remember, well, I won't say project names, but we used to work on, on project, and as the crunch time, uh, we were a couple weeks from, from, from the due date, the, the, they would just throw more people at it. But the problem was that we were all working on this, on this very, uh, you know, this fixed set of, of, 
of, of, of lines where we, could own, where we could contribute to. So the more people we got, it really didn't help anything. But with microservices, because you're splitting everything out, you can actually have more p the, the amount of parallelization is actually greater. You can actually have more people, if this is more important, or if this needs to scale faster, you, you can work on that. And there's, because like, another big advantage to microservices is that because they can be released at different versions, your development velocity is different. It actually makes sense, it makes it possible for you to, to focus on key microservices uh, uh, and prioritize them over others. If this is working now, let's start adding features over here. We don't have to touch this for now. Uh, but then the microservices themselves, they give you this greater stability and really greater utilization of your hardware. Because now, your services themselves can run between ser server and server, their containers or, or VMs, they can move around. Uh, but beyond that, now that your services are, are up and running, you can actually pack them in tighter in, in, uh, in, in your hardware. Uh, again, I remember we would just order, if we wanted more reliability with these monolithic applications, we just ordered you know, redundant CPUs, redundant power supplies, more, more hard drives, RAID everything, more memory. And these were very expensive servers, but now we can actually just pick cheap cloud servers and just deploy to them. If something happens to the server or something happens to the service, it's, it's not something we worry about. Uh, and then because these services, the microservices themselves, if we, if we build them right, they'll be smaller and more targeted. And this is code that we can reuse in other, within other, uh, with internally within organization, or we can op open source them and make them available to everyone. And so, the big thing, the big advantages to microservices are one, the increase in speed of development, right? From 24 months, this is a real increase from like 24, 18 months when I started to now we, in a couple of months, you can get the first version out and then you can iterate constantly. So every couple of weeks you can get new versions and beyond versions, this concept of versions doesn't really apply anymore. You have new releases daily. I mean, I've heard of, of you know, some of the cloud companies where they're having releases, uh, like 20, 30 releases every couple hours. So it's something that it, it just becomes, uh, it, it just becomes different way of thinking. And then your cost is reduced. It's reduced in a bunch of ways. You're not buying this huge expensive hardware, but beyond that, your developers are developing all the time. They're not waiting, they're not on the bench, you know, for a huge percentage of time waiting for other people to do their jobs. Everyone's doing, everyone's working at, the, at sort of a, a constant process. Your resilience is improved. Now you have the advantage of having your application be sort of architected for failure. And so you can, you can, you can because we know that failure is a reality, we can just work around that and we can have uh, we can understand that reality and just work around that and make sure that the application is always available. You have increased flexibility, right? When you build your application, when you, for example, the way we work, we, we develop everything on, on, on containers and so on our, on our MacBooks we can develop uh, and it's the same exact, uh, same exact backend, same exact microservices are going to run here as they're going to run in our cloud environment. And then one of the bigger things, one of the bigger tenets of microservices is that you want visibility into your, into what, into everything basically. You want greater, you have greater visibility into your processes, your services running, but then your applications are also built with a different paradigm. Now we, because these are web and we get, con it's a constant connection, we know how our users are using them. We know we can do uh, A-B testing. We, can, we basically have a better understanding of everything from the deployment, from the hardware, the software, to the way that the tools are being utilized. And so really, it ends up being these four things that we focus on the most, right? That these are the, the most important uh, components of microservices. You have, like I said, the architecture and technology, which is what everyone talks about, but I think it's equally important to, and, it's, and if we don't consider the last two, the organization, the methodology, I think that really puts you at a disadvantage when you're building your solutions. What ends up happening is that you, you may have the best technology, but if your teams can't leverage it, or if you don't have your methodologies, your procedures ready, 
uh, the greatest technology really can, can only get you so far. So when we look at the architecture, we, we look at these, the, the, these key principles to, to microservices, right? And I, in a little bit, I'll talk about the 12-factor app, but I like these because these are, you know, as an old Linux guy, I really, this really reminds me of the Unix principles, right? So do one thing well. Have your microservices, whatever they're focused on, whatever they're supposed to do, don't let, don't let feature creep get into them. Let, let whatever it does, let them do it well. If it needs to do something else, build another microservice. If you need to change the way something works, just version it, create another version. There's no need, you don't have to be stuck in this world of ever increasing microservices. Build afresh. If, if your API almost does what you need, uh, but you have consumers using it right now, just create a next, another version. Uh, build off of it, but don't, don't ex because you were always, the idea is that the beauty of microservices is that people can continue to, con to or services can continue to consume uh, a version, you can just create a new version. And in OpenStack, we know that, right? We've seen that in, in the changes of the API. Um, and this one's, these two are kind of obvious, right? Expect the output to become an, in, to become an input to someone else. So a service the, that, that returns something, should, you should assume that it, a human being isn't asking for, for that, isn't connecting to that service. You should assume that it's going to be another automated process connecting and expecting a result. So, you know, sort of an addendum to this is that, you know, this goes to the fact that the, all the information should be in the request, it should be stateless. Uh, again, this is something that, that really is dealt with uh, more comprehensively in the 12 factors. Uh, the next one's try early, man. Don't, don't wait to, to release it after six months. If you, let's work towards a, uh, an MVP, a minim, minimal viable, minimum viable product. Let's get it out there, let's get it, if people like it, we can work on, we can, uh, we can sort of improve and add on to that. But if they don't like it, if no one's using it, then why are you, why are you wasting your time develop, developing that? Then throw that away and let's start with something else. Uh, next, and to me, this is the most important one. Invest in automated tooling. The, and again, I, I, I was really happy that, that the infra team was, was up there this morning. It's, it, it, it takes time to do it, but it takes time to do it, it, it takes time to set it up once. After that, it is, it's done. You don't have to, occasionally you may have to tweak stuff. All those, te like for example, just, no matter how much time the OpenStack team spent creating the infra, after I think, what was the number, 1.7 million test runs? Imagine how much time if a human being had been involved with each of those, okay? And when we look now, the, the next factor is the, the technology that you use, right? Um, the, the big obvious one is cloud provisioning. You, you have to have an, auto, an automated approach, an automated way to deploy uh, either containers, virtual machines, bare metal, whatever it is, it has to be an automated way. Uh, so that means that you have to standardize and standardize and easy ways to standardize are choosing virtualization, containerization, uh, platform as a service, whatever it is, you have to standardize and that really helps you when it comes to deployment and managing your deployments. Uh, you have to worry about your, the way you integrate your applications, right? Where do the, where do, where does the authentication sit? What are your communication uh, methods? What is the, anyway, you have to worry about how you integrate because at the end of the day, that's the key to the application. All these services have to be able to talk to each other, they have to be authenticated, they have to be, you want them to be secure, right? But then again, there's always this constant, you will always have legacy technologies. So what does that mean? Uh, it means, you know, relational databases, uh, perhaps some, some files that you have that you have to read. But when you're working with these, you have to find interfaces that, that sort of abstract them or 
or use them in a way that don't have, like for example, with some databases you have uh, always on connections, that, that's not a good way to do it if you have these microservices that are designed to, to live and die and it doesn't, it doesn't affect anyone. Uh, again, manage your security. Now there's all these considerations about how do you manage security? Do you have an API gateway? Do you have a uh, single sign-on tokens? How is that managed? Um, your, uh, and then, you know, the, the, the other big one to me is the, the beauty of this open cloud is this polyglot nature in not only languages and databases, but really in everything else in the, the messaging. Do we, what do we use for message queues? What do we use for databases? What do we use for programming languages? And really the answer is it's a combination of what's the best tool and what's the best tool that we can use. So are your organizations built for Java development, for PHP, for uh, Swift, for whatever? Uh, let the, the beauty of this is you can build something, release it, and if, and if you find that your skills have changed and migrated to something else, you can now, the next version you release, build it and release it on something else, right? And so, you know, when we look at the technology, specifically technologies, the core ones that, that, that we consider, that we talk about, are really containers. I mean, containers, a way to encapsulate either containers or virtual machines. Uh, then we have this idea of service discovery, right? So that the, there's no, the containers, the virtual machines, because the, this is the world of IPs and ports, we really, we really have to invest in a way to automatically detect the, the IPs, basically the resources as they exist in, uh, in IPs and ports. Uh, and then we need an automated way to sort of deploy, to grow, to shrink your resources, your deployments. Uh, and then finally, the, the big thing, the big advantage to API gateways is that your security and your routing is all managed by this sort of your, 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 your front end. And so it's the single point that handles authentication, uh, security, uh, access control. And the big thing, it, and the reason that it's advantageous is that we don't have to put that code in the actual services. The services themselves can be simpler. Okay, when we look at, when we look at the organization, when we look at the organization, the keys to success to the organization, we're really thinking about what are our teams aligned to, right? Are they aligned to, to, business, to lines of businesses or are they aligned to technologies? And sort of the, the difference here is that if they're aligned to sort of a, our project is something, for example, us, it, are we aligned to this uh, Swift package catalog where we are all working for its success? Or do we all have our own VPs and executives that we have to, you know, in, in worst case, go to them and ask them to, to fight for us or, again, or, or fight against somebody else? So is there, like, are we removing these political barriers? Do, are we working as a team? Um, how are the responsibilities divided, right? That's, a, again, an extension of that first one. Do we, every time we need a design resource, do we need to go and, and talk to an executive to get it? And when they give us the, the resource, or if we don't implement it, do, do people yell at us if we don't do it exactly the way they said it? Uh, and then, you know, because we're operators now, because we're deploying and, and running this in the cloud, how are we doing DevOps? Do we, do we have like a, a dedicated team that does DevOps and then we just hand it off to them? In which case, we as developers probably don't care uh, don't care how, uh, don't care if things break, don't really care about the infrastructure. All we care about is getting my code out and getting, fixing bugs. Or if we're all, wor or if we're all working as a team, you know, it, where everyone does, like releases and develops and does, you know, we all fix stuff and we all work as a team, then, you know, it, it's in my interest to make sure that the application is stable and reliable so that, you know, that not only does the team not get calls on Friday night, but I don't get calls Friday night. And then what are, what are the size of our teams? How, how big, how small should we make them? Well, you know, there's a couple, there's a couple stories. I heard yesterday, I think, 
Uh, Jeff was mentioning that Bezos wanted his teams to be two pizza-sized teams, right? So if you can feed two, two, if you can feed your team with two pizzas, that's about as large as you want your team to be. Well, that might be a good rule of thumb. Uh, and the beauty is that if your microservice is getting to, to be bigger than that, you might be able to split it up and, and separate the, the separate the the functionality into multiple microservices. And then how do you handle your, your communication between teams, right? Is this, and this really comes down to, in, you know, in, in, in seeing it at work is like how some teams are like really aggressive, some are passive aggressive, some are, so it ends up being how do you communicate? How can you best work together? And I mean, large organization, large projects like OpenStack, we see this a lot. And so this is one of those things where how is it that, that your, your team communicates and works together, right? And then finally, where's the power? Is, is this project sit under, under design? Does this project sit under development, under sales? Who owns it? Because at the end of the day, you really want to have everyone sort of feel, be on the same boat and going in the same direction, okay? Uh, next is your, your, the final one here is the methodology, right? And again, when we're building, when we're, it's really important to know, are we releasing a, 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 a product that ha will have a release and then we will work on the next one and we can improve? Or do we have this long lived project where we don't really care, where we don't really care about today, we know we're gonna release it forever, we're gonna maintain it forever. And really the idea should be that these services get released and then you move on to the next version, next version, basically the next product. And the idea that way is that you really, you're never complacent. You're never, you're never tied to something. You can always, you can always, you can always change. You're not married to any, any approach, any technology. Uh, is your development agile? Are you move, are you working together? Are you doing fast? Or are you doing this waterfall where everyone's separate and it's taking us a lot of time? Uh, you know, and then the other one is who controls your business requirements, right? Is, is it coming from, does, again, this is sort of like the, the, the power thing. Is it coming from the, is it coming from the business, the, the business side, you're, you're offering management who's saying you need to do this, this, and this feature, even though it hasn't been, even though we have user testing that says that no one's going to use that, that nobody cares. Or is it coming from the fact that you have this instrumented, uh, these in, because your application is so instrumented, you actually have numbers to back up what users are doing and what they want, right? This, this one, the, the next one's, you know, my sort of, my pet one, the one where the fear of change or the, the fear of continuous delivery. You know, I'll, I'll tell you, in IBM, that was really a big one. When we, when we, with our website, when we release, we release all the time to production, and that was such a big thing. And actually, the way we got it, we, we basically, we ended up doing it was just, after a while, they forgot about us, so we just kept doing it and, and pushing into production, and now they all think it was their great idea to do it, so. Uh, and then, again, the, your automation, man. It's very, very important that we, you know, that we automate the heck out of everything. Every process that you can do, if there's a human being that, that's involved somewhere, it's, it's critical that you, that you extract the human being from that. Uh, if you have uh, sort of this idea that everything works, uh, but, but you know, if somebody is the only expert in Docker and then he leaves, then that's not a good, he has to click a couple things before it works, that's not a good idea. You need to make it automatic. So that, every, so that everything can flow without touching a human being. And you know, this is the, and so this is the mantra when you're building these new 12 fat, these new uh, microservices, right? This idea of the, uh, the 12 factor app. And so, you know, it, it, it's almost obvious, it's almost in retrospect, it's almost like I can't believe we didn't have this before. We, I can't believe we hadn't communicated this before. It's such a clear way to, to basically build your, your cloud native applications. And it also provides a, a, a really clear guideline to how, what you need to do to migrate your existing 
monolithic applications. Right? So I think for the rest of the day, what we're going to do is we're going to go over these. And we're going to see how we can use how you know the backing services, your services, your what we're calling your infrastructure services, your databases, your uh, your messaging, your uh, file storage. How all of those are handled by some of these. How your microservices themselves, your your functions are handled by another, some more. And then how finally DevOps handles the rest. So the rest of the day, I think we'll spend looking at that, right? In, in part two, in, in the next part, uh, Dan's gonna talk about, uh, or actually Sean and Andy are gonna talk about your infrastructure, your backends, right? And they'll cover these. They'll, they'll talk about your backend services, how we handle logging, and how you, we handle your special admin processes. In the microservices, your delivering application microservices, Dan will talk about the dependencies, your, how your applications handle dependencies, configurations, the processes themselves, uh, how you bind to ports, your, your service concurrency, and your disposability. Okay? And in the final part, uh, Megan and Michael will talk about your DevOps, deploying with DevOps. And this will really focus on how you use sort of the Git and, and Jenkins to, to manage, how, how you handle, use Git to manage your code base, how you have your Jenkins and Garrett and whatever to do your build, release, and run, and then how you basically, how you develop on an environment similar to what you, you run in production, okay? And the way we're going to show you this, so again, what we're going to do is half the time, about half the time, we'll spend talking about the theory and using examples from open technologies. But then the other half is we'll walk you through this demo. The demo is something called the IBM BluePick. If you guys just do on GitHub, uh, switch, search for IBM BluePick. It is by IBM Swift. And this is what it is. We have this microservice application on the left-hand side we have the, there's two client access methods. We have an iOS Swift application. For those of you with a Mac, you can test it out that way, or we have a web app for, for those of you who, well, who don't, don't have a Mac or don't want to use that. Um, then the main service is this yellow, the central one. It's a Kitura, it's a Swift Kitura. Kitura is a web framework for Swift, for server-side Swift. And we have a Kitura backend. And basically, the, the iOS application or the web app connects through this mobile access client, uploads a picture, puts it in, sends it to Kitura. Kitura then takes your picture, stores it in object storage, then creates an entry in your Cloudant backend database. At that point, an OpenWhisk action is triggered. OpenWhisk is sort of this open source uh, serverless framework. It's similar to Lambda or to, what was the other one? Cloud functions. It, it, the idea is that it's an event-driven uh, um, event driven serverless uh, applications or, or, or anyway, it's that. And what, we, what OpenWhisk does is then it, it's triggered. It says that you upload a picture. It connects to the, uh, to the Watson Alchemy Vision and it does an analysis of the picture. It also uses insights for weather to see if there's any weather-related information from the picture. And then it posts, it publishes that back in your cloud and it connects to cloud it and uploads it and tags your picture. So what we'll see in, in the demo today, after we're done, we've done building it in, in the last one, we'll actually see this work. We'll take a picture and then we'll analyze it and, and tell us what, what it sees. All right. So again, guys, this is, these are our, our, our keys to success, and I have one minute for questions. Oh, and it's very important to, for you guys to know that after the next session, there will be beer over there. So, <laughs> so you had a question? Can you come to the first slide, the first slide of the presentation? The first slide of the... This one? Okay. Oh, that one.
All right. All right, guys, if you have any questions, if not, we'll, I mean, we're here all day, all afternoon, and I think it, it'll be a, an interesting day. Say that again? Part two is in five minutes, in, in 10 minutes. Absolutely. So, you know, it's, it's interesting. When we came to the summit, I, I really like this summit a lot for a lot of reasons, right? One of the, one of the big reasons is that you're not focused on, on just, this is, this is such a community that realizes that there's much more than just this one technology. And beyond that, the technology itself really, really embraces others. So you see that in the embrace of, of Docker. You see that with the, with, when we talk about Cloud Foundry, we always talk about OpenStack. And you see that in, actually, with, with Canonical talking about their, their container technologies. And you, so you see that. And so what, we didn't want to focus on a specific, on a specific technology, in a specific, you know, project. What this is, is a high level view using the, and all of this, 100%, is applicable to, to OpenStack. Okay. Well, specifically on this, we'll see the, the object storage. Will you be using the object storage? We can talk about that. So his question was that one of the most problematic problematic areas is global transactions and we see that also and that so I said that microservices have many advantages uh, the biggest disadvantage is that as you create more microservices there's more time communicating between things and so we can talk about that after but yeah I agree that's that's the that's the biggest issue okay thank you